When you talk about athletic primes, it's usually about a player and when they were at their absolute peak. It's hard to imagine being able to identify the prime of an entire league. It's January 2016, and 80,000 people pack into the MCG to watch the Melbourne Derby, the Stars versus Renegades. The Big Bash has been building, from its comical infancy to its crescendo. Finch, Peterson, Gale, Faulkner, Hussey, Wade, Bravo, White, Wright, Maxwell, Stoinis, Zampa. These were all names in just these two teams, taking the stage in front of a Boxing day S crowd at 7pm for a T20 spectacle of a league that was born to be a cash-grabbing exhibition. And here it was, taking prime time slots and doing TV numbers rivaling the biggest codes in the country. And now, as the BBL enters its 12th iteration, its audience is at an all-time low. Although we haven't yet seen how this season will unfold, if last year's TV numbers are anything to go by, the league is hitting a rough patch. The sort of mid-2000s NBL rough patch that is going to take some serious reinvention to come out of. But to understand how the thing fell off, we have to explore what made it so good at one point in time. And to understand that, we've got to go all the way back to the beginning. The Big Bat has taken Australia by storm. The most explosive cricket event of the summer. The Big Bash is coming to seven. It's all the Big Bash highlights every night on 10 Eyewitness News. You see, Australian cricket was all about the Australian cricket team. All about the international competition. And the thing about nation versus nation international sport is that there is never a season. You just play games against each other for bragging rights and then every now and then there's a World Cup to determine the best nation of that era. But where the religious support of a sport and its teams come from is seasonal competition. Teams playing each other year in, year out. The ebbs and flows of the same players and sides. Familiarity with a team breeds support and more importantly, creates history and culture. The biggest sports in the world have seasons with clubs and identities. And that was something that cricket, particularly in Australia, was lacking. The country had domestic cricket, but it mattered to little. There was no decent TV deal, no money, no pride. It was merely a bunch of players vying for international selection. So in 2011, Cricket Australia launched big. They completely redid the domestic T20 league and invested everything they had, and made a couple very clever decisions along the way. They moved away from the state-based approach that had previously capped any domestic play at the six states, which left no room for expansion. They opted for a club-based city-to-city approach opening up crosstown rivalries and identity to a city, like most traditional sporting leagues. They pushed heavily for the right people to fill the right positions. You had magnates like Eddie Maguire lining up to head the boards of these teams, a major commercial push compared to the all in-house cricket boards of previous. But most importantly, they poured everything they had into the marketing, with some ballsy decisions paying off. They opted to put teams in ugly neon colours with no nod to any history, tradition or just good looking uniforms and rather attempted to create marketable colour based identities with these teams. And it worked. They also timed it to perfection. 2011 marked the end of an era for Australian cricket as it was an exit for Ponting's superheroes, the God Squad that won the most consecutive test matches in history and the players who became household names in the process. And coming out of test cricket, there's no better way to subsidise income and relevance than to join the hot new ticket in town. And so much forgotten, but the first instances of the Big Bash had Shane Warne, Matthew Hayden, Ricky Ponting, Brett Lee, Michael Hussey, just to name a few, putting on their colours with real investment in the teams. The Big Bash was here, and it was everything it was designed to be. It was fast, it was loud, it was colourful, and it was above all else, a spectacle television product that demanded to be watched because it just could not be ignored. Top international talent began to take notice and all of a sudden you had Chris Gale, Paul Collingwood, Brendan McCullum, Herschel Gibbs, Shahid Afridi all playing the inaugural season with much bigger names yet to arrive. The nature of this non-organic lab experiment of a competition 
meant that it could have so easily become a flash in the pan. Could have pandered to the lowest common denominator and died as quickly as it was born. But the on-field performances gave this thing legs. Because no matter how fresh it may have been, you put the best talent on the field in front of a lot of eyes and magic is bound to happen. Brett Lee nearly taking a hat-trick in his final over of cricket ever, just to lose the championship on a missed run out on the last ball of the season. Craig Simmons' fastest ever BBL century off 39 balls. The semi-final no-ball controversy between the Stars and the Scorchers. Yasir Arafat's god-mode performance in the first ever Super Over. The Sydney Sixers took home the first ever BBL title, featuring baby Moises Enriquez, baby Steve Smith, baby Mitchell Stark and an ageing Stuart McGill and Brett Lee. The second season saw the unlikely Brisbane Heat steal victory from the Scorchers, featuring Nathan Horridge, Kemar Roach, and some soon-to-be champions of the franchise. This result was an underdog story where there hadn't even been enough history to create favourites yet. But this league defied its youth, and when Channel 10 bought the first free-to-air coverage for $100 million in 2013, the BBL never looked back. So let's head back to the 2016 January Melbourne Derby and reflect. Despite its tiny history, this absurd Artline Highlighter League had built a following amassing a game day audience of 80,000 people, which was larger than the Boxing Day test that summer or any Carlton Collingwood game that year. The TV viewership had an average, average of 1.1 million viewers per game, thrashing the AFL and the NRL by 200,000 people. It was the most watched product in the country, and even more importantly, in just five years of existence, it had built history and lore. The Sydney Sixers and Perth Scorchers had built a Lakers-Celtics-like rivalry that would only grow. One of these two teams had been in every BBL final to that point, and flash forward to the current day, those teams have won seven of the 11 titles played out. The Melbourne Stars had developed a comical timeline having drawn in the most star power and creating the best teams, becoming the envy of the league just to lose five straight semi-finals, creating a cult curse. There were genuine crosstown rivalries between the west and east of Sydney and Melbourne and supporter-based rivalries over which team you supported. The Chris lynn brendan McCullum partnership up in Brisbane being coined as the new age Mark Maguire and Jose Canseco. And this is the partnership, the power partnership that has lit up BBL. Peak performance I remember was when the Bash Brothers chased down the Perth Scorchers score at the Wacker. Um. Favourite Bash Brothers moment was oh, any time we get to bat with each other. The Shane Warne, Marlon Samuels on-field fight igniting the Melbourne rivalry. Even in that 2015-16 season alone, a few nights before, Travis Head's New Year's Eve century in Adelaide to rescue the strikers from the depths of despair in front of a backdrop of year-end fireworks. Even that night, when Cameron White, former Stars captain, came out in his new red crosstown rival colours, he was booed in Australian cricket's version of Zlatan's move from Juventus to Inter Milan. A game for the ages, it was BBL1 OG Luke Wright, who upstaged the star imports of Gale, Peterson and Bravo, notching a 60-ball hundred to steer the Stars to a brilliant win in front of an indescribably electric atmosphere not seen since the birth of World Series cricket. People who thought cricket was the most boring sport on earth weren't just turning their heads, they were attending, because you couldn't avoid it. It was the biggest ticket in town and it was threatening an impending doom for test cricket. So how, as we sit heading into the hot part of BBL 12, is the product and its viewership so bad. In part two of this video, we'll examine exactly what happened to the BBL and why its numbers in TV viewership and live crowds went down and the recommendations from multiple sources as how they can drive traffic back up. In the meantime, feel free to check out Say What You Feel, the music video from Orange Orange, directed by him and shot by me. Thanks for watching. And I'll catch you next time.